Let's pray. Father God, we do come this morning and um, we do thank you, Father, for all things. And we thank you for being with us and blessing us and helping us, Father, through each and every day of our lives. And we do thank you, Father, for um, all those who are willing to sacrifice to give us the freedom, Father, to come and to openly worship you, Father, with no fear of anything. But we do ask you this morning, Father, for comfort for these families that suffer this morning. We ask you, Father, to to bless and touch those that are sick, Father, those uh, whose bodies have been afflicted with disease today, Father. We just lift them up to you and give them over to you and just ask that you, you help them today. Father, we ask your blessing and your will be done in this service, in this house today. We ask that everything that's said and done in this place be according to your will and your way. Help us, Father, today to respond to you in all things. Guide and direct our steps each and every day. And we thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Turning back. 
Change it someday for a crown. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God. Left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged, old rugged cross till my trophy is at last. I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wonder of beauty. I see, for it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged, old rugged. Till my trope is at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, his shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory is forever. So I'll cherish the old rugged, old rugged cross Till my trophy is at last I lay down I will cling to 
the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a clown. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Praise God. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Everybody. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood, everybody. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. The world looks upon me as I struggle alone. They say I have nothing, but they are so wrong. In my heart I'm rejoicing how I wish they could see. They blessings on me. Thank you, Lord. There's a roof up above me. I have a good place to sleep. There's food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Yes, Jesus. Amen. Now I know I'm not wealthy, and these clothes are not new. I don't have much money, but Lord, I have you. And to me, that's all that matters, though the world cannot see. Thank you, Lord, yes, for your blessings on me. 
There's a roof up above me. I've a good place to sleep. There is food on my table and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Yes, Lord. <coughs> blessings on me. Amen. Amen. Start turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 this morning. And if you uh, remember back when we studied the book of Matthew, um, I don't know, it took us about a year or a little bit to get through it, but if you remember anything about Matthew chapter 6, this is right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he is uh, really um, going through a lot of... Um, I guess I would call it the foundation of, of what his ministry was based on. He kind of um, laid this foundation and just kind of went out from there. But um, part of what we're going to talk about this morning is going to be familiar to you. Part of it um, may not be, I don't know, but I know at least uh, the first part of it is because we're going to be talking just briefly about the Lord's Prayer. And it's not we're not going to go in depth like we did before, but we are going to uh, kind of cover some things of it. And then we're going to go down to the end of the chapter and we're going to talk about some um, different things about seeking God's kingdom, but we're going to be looking at Matthew 6, 9 through 13, and then 25 through 34, if you want to start looking for it in your Bibles this morning, but um, we're going to change gears from what we've been talking about just a little bit, not a whole lot, but we're going to start talking about God's kingdom um, this morning, and I don't know how many, how long we'll be talking about it, it could be a week, two weeks, three weeks, you never know what, what the Lord's going to do, um, week, week to week, sometimes I never know minute for minute what he's going to do, but um, but we're going to be talking about uh, God's kingdom or the kingdom of God. And, and I really want us to pay some time and attention to what that means to us. When I say God's kingdom or the kingdom of God, what that means to us. Because when you start talking and you, and you hear people, a lot of times it, it boils down to when you ask somebody, well, what's the kingdom of God mean to you? They'll say heaven. It means heaven is what it means. And that's, that's part of it, but... And it, the kingdom of God does include heaven, but the kingdom of God is not um, confined to heaven. It's, it's much bigger than heaven, if you can imagine that. Imagine how big heaven is, and the kingdom of God itself, though, is more than just heaven. It is not specifically bound to heaven, and it's not specifically um, bound to any kind of boundaries like a, like a nation or a city or a town or anything like that. And, um, and But in this morning, I want us to kind of dig into that meaning just a little bit. We're going to do so um, looking a little bit in the Gospels. We're going to spend most of our time in Matthew, but there are a couple of other verses I do want to point out in, uh, in, uh, in Mark, and then also a verse over in Luke, and, and, um, and we're going to kind of get into those things. But um, Mark chapter 1, I'm going to read, this is what happened, this is before we even get to the Sermon on the Mount. This is um, some of the uh, first things that Jesus said. When, um, when he was preaching and he was going through the ministry here in Mark chapter 1. And this is um, right, at, <clears throat> right after John the Baptist was arrested. He said this. It says, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And he said this. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, the key thing I want to focus there is um, the kingdom of God is near. Notice he didn't say the kingdom of God is, is, is far away. He said the kingdom of God is near. And he tells him, he says, repent and believe the good news. <clears throat> and then if you go over to Luke chapter 4, um, this is Jesus has been out preaching in this town and, and he had went out and he had found this solitary place to pray and he had went out and he had came back and the people were trying to convince him to stay with him and he tells them something and starting in verse 42 it says at daybreak Jesus went out to a solitary place he says the people were looking for him and when they came to where he was they tried to keep him from leaving that's what, uh, what I was saying there but he said I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is why I've been sent. He says, and he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. 
And the reason I pointed out those two verses there, the first one there, is um, Jesus is telling them how near the kingdom of God is. And he's telling them what they have to do to realize the kingdom of God. And, um, and you've got to kind of dig into it and understand the context there. Jesus is preaching to them with urgency. He's not telling them this, oh, you know, guys, uh, y'all need to get it and get it together because the kingdom of God's coming. He's saying the kingdom of God is near. It's upon us. It is right before us. He says you need to understand what's being taught. You need to repent and believe what I'm going to teach you in the Gospels is what he's trying to tell them. He's trying to tell us the same thing, by the way. <clears throat> there's a message in the Gospels. and There's more to the message in the Gospels than just salvation, too, by the way. There's a lot more there. But he says the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And then he goes on. And he says this other part. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also. Because this is why I was sent. You see, Jesus' mission to us is to what? To go and to share the gospel. To make disciples. He says, go. He doesn't say stay. He doesn't say just, uh, just kind of hang out. He doesn't say wait till people come to you and you give them the gospel. See, we get in that habit a lot of times. We'll just wait for somebody to come to us and we expect them to come in here. We expect people just to come flooding through the church doors and then, and then share the gospel with them. It doesn't happen that way. It's not, those days are over. They're over and gone with. Sometimes I don't think you can beat people with a stick to get them to church. It's not, that's not how the gospel is meant to be shared. We're to go out and to share the gospel. Remember what he told them in the book of Acts, the very beginning of the book of Acts. This is before Jesus ascended to heaven. What did he say? He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And that power is not just to jump around and, and act crazy. That power is to go out and to, and to share the gospel. He says in Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. That's where we're to go and we're to be the people of God to go and to share the gospel. But we've got to understand the gospel. We've got to understand what the kingdom of God is before we can go out and tell people about the kingdom of God, right? And then when people hear about the kingdom, they accept Jesus. They start following the kingdom. Yeah, then they may come into the church and then we can teach and educate and send them back out. We should be out. And sharing the gospel, that's what we're called to do. And it's an urgent message. It's urgent because time is near. The kingdom of God is near. Do we understand that, that the kingdom of God is near this morning? Do we know that? Look around. It's near. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. This is what, that was, that's actually John the Baptist said. That is Matthew uh, 3, 2. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. This is before Jesus it was even started preaching. John the Baptist was there. He said, I need to tell the people they need to repent because the kingdom of God is near. And that kingdom of God they're talking about is not just salvation, like I said. It's much more. You all know salvation is just the beginning. It's kind of like the doorway into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is much more than just salvation. The gospel is much more than just salvation. Much more. That's the beginning of the kingdom of God. Salvation is the beginning of it all. But people will go by and miss it right in front of them. They miss it every day. They miss the kingdom of God being revealed every single day. We miss it every day. Because we don't understand what Jesus is trying to tell us. We don't have a, have a good grasp on it. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Some of what Jesus says about the kingdom of God in the Gospels. I'm going to read again. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Then I'm going to skip down and read 25 through 34. And then we'll get right into it. Starting in verse 9, he says this. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We know that. Recite that. Every funeral I ever preach, that's the last thing I say. That's my prayer as we're leaving. It's the Lord's prayer. That's not on accident. Because we're praying for God's deliverance. 
Then uh, verse 25. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. Yet, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add one single hour to his life? You can't. You take a lot of time away from it. But you can't add to it. He says, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. And this is probably one of the most true statements in all the Bible. Each day has enough trouble of its own, does it not? Let's pray this morning. Father, we come one more time, and I do thank you today, Father. I just uh, thank you for blessing and being with each one of us here. I ask you, Father, to move. Move on me. Give me the words to speak. Move on this congregation. Help us to respond to you. Be with us. Help us today. I thank you, Father, for all things. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. Amen. All right. Now, like I say, the first, very first part of this, Jesus is... Um, talking to his disciples about prayer, and he's teaching them about how to pray. We, we've studied all this before, and, and how they should really structure their prayer. He's not telling them exactly what to say, but he's giving them this structure, this kind of outline of what, what to kind of say and, and what to do and how to, how to, how to um, prepare themselves is, I guess, a good way to, a good way to uh, talk about it. And, and if you look at things in the context of what he's actually saying here, we may get a, different, little, a little bit of different idea about it. But I'm going to read it one more time. It says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a key part of it. And he says, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And what I want us to pay attention there is Jesus is not telling them to pray about things that are far away, far off. He's saying, give us today our daily bread. He says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. He's saying, do this today, not ten years from now. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We don't want to be the, uh, wait to be delivered from Satan, do we? You don't want to praise, oh, Lord, deliver him from Satan all oh, sometime. You don't want to say, oh, Lord, help me resist temptation sometime down the road. He's saying, pray for that today. Pray for those things today. Pray for your daily needs and your daily bread today. And he's also saying, yeah, pray for deliverance from Satan today. Pray for, uh, to be delivered from um, all temptation and all the things that bog you down today. He says it's a daily thing. It's a daily walk. It's a daily prayer. It's a, and there's nothing wrong with praying for things for the future, having hopes and dreams and ideas about the future. But instead of praying, Lord, give me, give me, give me, pray, Lord, reveal to me your will, reveal to me your way, reveal to me your wishes, your hopes, your dreams for me, and help me to, to be obedient and to follow your way so I can realize that. That's what he's talking about, but it's today. And then he says here, and the point I want to get to here is he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he's not talking about his will being done on earth as it is in heaven next week, next year, ten years from now. He's saying pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven today. Do we do that? Do we pray for God's will to be done today? Or do we say, oh, Lord, eventually open their eyes. Oh, Lord, eventually help them. He says, pray for it today. Pray expecting it to happen today. And if God didn't want us to pray for it today, He wouldn't have put it in here. 
It wouldn't have been part of this prayer because that would not have been how it was structured. But he's talking about the here and now. You know, Jesus, when we think about um, what is God's kingdom today? What is God's will? What's God's will in heaven? Is there, is there war in heaven? No. Is there hate in heaven? Is there sin in heaven? Is there fear in heaven? Is there anxiety in heaven? Okay. Is there death in heaven? All those things, he said, that is God's will for heaven. He said, pray for those things on earth. We look around, none of that's here on earth, is it? None of it's here. You see, but he says, your kingdom come. Your kingdom is near is what Jesus says. How is it possible if it doesn't line up with what we see all around us? How is that even possible? How is it happening? Because Jesus wouldn't say that God's kingdom is near if he didn't mean it was near. If he didn't mean it could be realized. See, God's kingdom can be realized right here, right now, today. For all those who call Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. Do you know that you can enter into God's kingdom when you accept Jesus? You see, when God's kingdom is found, wherever God's will is being done. That can be a hospital, that can be a nursing home, that can be a jail, that can be a school, that can be a, wherever you work at, that can be your home. And yes, that can be your church. Now, there's a lot of churches that are not part of God's kingdom. There's a lot of churches that claim to be um, places of worship, places where God is, and they're not part of God's kingdom because they're not following God's will. Big churches, small churches, medium-sized churches, if you're not following God's will, that's not where God's kingdom is, and that's not where God's kingdom is to be found. See, God's kingdom is found wherever there are God's people gathered together and following God's will. And when you're doing that, you're in God's kingdom right then. And you can have peace. Remember last week we talked about peace? That peace that passes all understanding. I think it was that last Sunday night. I don't even remember when. It was sometime last week. But we talked about peace and that peace that passes all understanding and the peace of God. See, you can have that peace right here and now. You don't have to wait till you die and go to heaven to realize peace. You don't have to wait to realize joy, happiness. You don't have to wait to be free of fear and anxiety. Even the fear of death, you don't have to wait. Because death comes. And it takes all of us. But we don't have to wait. We don't have to be afraid of that. We don't have to be anxious about that. Because we can take comfort in God and being part of God's kingdom. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Realizing God's kingdom. And what well, He wants us to realize this. Do we want to be a part of that? Is that what we want for our lives? Is that what we want for our families? Is that what we want for our children and our grandchildren? Do we want them to realize that? Or do we want to just kind of go along with the flow? Remember, we talked a lot about just going with the flow, not to, not to cause trouble or anything like that. I'm gonna, let me find this here. This, I, I learned this song when I was a child. Because, bless our hearts, Growing up in the Baptist church, they would sing a song and they would sing it and sing it, altar call for hours, it seemed like. And you learned the song. But I have decided to follow Jesus. We have to make that decision to first follow Jesus. But the, the second uh, verse, or third verse, I'm sorry, it says, Though none go with me, I still will follow. Will we decide? Will we follow even though nobody's going to go with us? If you're going to be all by yourself, will you still follow Jesus? Will you still seek after God's kingdom? Will you still seek after God's will? Because if you're not willing to do that, you will fall away. You know, and that's what it looks. It says, at last, since I have decided to follow Jesus, and I, it says, no turning back, no turning back. That's where so many people fall into trouble and get into trouble. That's where I got into trouble. You know, I turned back so many times. You said, no, nope, I ain't going to do it. I had to play with God, play games, just do whatever. But he says, no turning back. If you make that decision, you can't turn back. There is no turning back. You've got to go and you've got to move forward and you've got to keep moving, regardless of what happens. Because life is hard. It's going to be hard. There's going to be bad things that are going to happen. But you have to decide regardless of what's going to happen. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep following God. Regardless. And when you do, 
flip it over to the other side, I'll fly away. Oh, my goodness. I love that song. I, that's what I love it. I'll fly away, oh, glory, I'll fly away. You believe that? That's what I'm waiting on. I'm waiting to fly out of here. You know, some of you know me very well. One of my childhood dreams was to fly, was to fly airplanes. <sighs> Marine Corps recruiter one time tried to talk me into this, going to let me fly. Overweight kid, uh, could, couldn't see. Uh, if I take my glasses off, I can't even see Dale. Yeah, we'll let you fly planes. I was a mm hmm. <laughs> he thought he was going to get a two for one deal. He got my older brother. He thought he was going to get me too. But I fly away. Think about that, flying away. You don't need no airplane or no helicopter or anything like that. You will fly. You will rise from the dead and follow Jesus. You will fly into the sky and off to wherever he wants you to be. And you will be with him forever and ever. And if you can't take joy and happiness in that, there's nothing left. There's nothing left. But he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As is in heaven. But we have to decide whether we want to be a part of that. And see, what we don't ever get to is how this relates to the end of the chapter there. And he says this. I'm going to read 25 through 34 one more time. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Think how much time we spent wasting worrying about that stuff. Worrying about what we're going to eat or drink. I worry about that a lot. It's always on my mind. Can you tell? Huh, what am I going to eat for dinner? Hmm. Huh. What kind of chicken am I going to eat today? Ain't that right, Caden? Caden's my chicken man. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. How much time do we waste worrying about what clothes we're going to put on? Because of how, so how we're going to look in front of somebody. I do. I lay out my, I try to match. I don't know. Michelle tells me half time, I don't match. I say, I don't care. I'll like it together, so I'm going to wear it. <laughs> but I still worry. We all still worry about it. If we didn't, we wouldn't come in here with these things on. They're burning me up. But he says, Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? What can we add to our life by worrying about things that we have absolutely zero control over? Zero control. We have this, uh, this idea that we have all this control over things. We are in zero control of the end outcome of anything. And we worry and worry and worry and worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just do what God says. Do God's will. Let the chips fall where they fall. And things are not always going to be great. And guess what? You may make mistakes along the way. That's just part of it. But he says, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not, will he not much more clothe you? Now you may not have the fanciest or the nicest, but he'll make sure you got what you need. He says, Oh, you of little faith, so, I, so do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. God knows what we need. Do we know that? Do we know God already knows everything that we absolutely need? He knows it. He created it. He created us. He created the universe. He knows what we need. He knows what we want, but He also knows what we need. And if we need it, he will, it will be there. He says, but seek first his kingdom. And there it is. Seek first his kingdom. And if we weren't to seek after the kingdom of God here and now, if our job was to just wait for us to die and go to heaven to realize God's kingdom, he would have never said, seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek after God's kingdom. Seek after God's righteousness. Seek after God's will. Spend your day seeking after God. He says... And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, 
Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I tell you, sometimes I think trouble finds us, don't it? We ain't even looking for it, and it just comes and finds us. Yeah. So, oh, look, I'm, here I am. I'm trouble. I'm at the door. You going to let me in? Yeah. Sometimes we don't have a choice. It just breaks in us. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about next week, next month, next year. What's going to happen is going to happen. I'm just honest. What's going to happen is going to happen. And we don't know. We don't know. You know, they talk about in Sunday school the gift of prophecy. You know, Brother Bowen made a good point. What do we all pray and hope for? The gift of healing. We hear all the time. You know, he, told, he, he said this morning, he's exactly right. That was one of the problems with that church. Everybody wanted the same gift. They weren't seeking after God's kingdom. They were seeking after themselves. They were seeking after their will. And there's nothing wrong with desiring a gift if that's what God's will is. I mean, that'd be great. The real true gift of healing would be great. Somebody was sick and you could touch them and heal them. Yeah, that'd be great. But here's the thing about the gift of prophecy, too. That's a hard gift. That'd be a hard gift to have. Because you would have to stand. Think about the prophets in the Old Testament. Stood and told Israel what the results of their sin were going to be. I can understand why people wouldn't want the gift of prophecy. To know what's going to happen. And to understand and to try to warn people and to see people every single day. Not following Jesus. Not submitting to Him. Not giving up their sin. Not seeking after his kingdom. Because here's the thing. You don't have to have the gift of prophecy to see, to understand and to know what's going to happen for those people. The Bible told, tells us they will die lost, undone, apart from God, destined for a devil's hand. That's what the Bible tells us. You don't have to have a spiritual gift. All you have to do is be able to read and understand what God's word says. We don't want that. For us, what's it mean for us? Well, number one, Dad, you come play supper again. Number one, what it means to us is if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have never entered into the door into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. That is the key that unlocks the door. You know, there's all kinds of things. Uh, some trivia here. I'm, I'm going to give you some trivia. In the Gospels, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The word salvation or saved is mentioned 23 times. Do you realize that? That's pretty important as far as the number of times something, a subject is mentioned with all the things that it talks about. The kingdom of God, 120 times. And Jesus' point he's trying to get across is that key, that key. Salvation is the key. But don't just stop there. That opens the door and allows you to come into God's kingdom. But if you just stop there, you may find that the door gets shut because you've never followed through with God's will. So if you need to walk through that open door, you need to do that this morning. You need to come to Jesus this morning. You need to accept Jesus this morning. Now maybe you've done that. Maybe you have, but you're just kind of Waiting. Waiting on heaven to come to you. No. Seek God's will. And follow God's will. Maybe you need to come and repent of that. Lord, I'm sorry. I've just been sitting around waiting. But I want to seek your kingdom. I want to seek your will every single day. If you need to do that, come and do that this morning. Maybe there's something else you need. I don't know. I don't know every need that we have. But maybe God has put somebody or something on your heart that you need to come and pray about. If He's put it on your heart, He wants you to do it. And if He wants you to do it, you should be obedient to Him and come and do it. Not because I say so. Not because somebody else in the congregation is expecting you to. But because the Holy Spirit is pushing you to. Asking you to. There is a reason for it. I don't know all the reasons for it, but there is a reason. Or God wouldn't ask you to do it. 
So if he's laid anything on your heart, I'd encourage you to come and pray about it. Stand with me if you will, please. I'm going to let them sing and just do as God has told you this morning. Father God, we do come today and we do thank you so much. And we just praise you today, Father, for the many blessings and the many times, Father, that you've taken us and you've helped us and you've delivered us, Father, from different things. And, and we do this morning, Father, We one more time, Father, we lift up Carol to you today, Father. We just ask for a touch on her today, a touch on her body, her soul, her spirit today, Father. We ask for strength and encouragement, Father. And we just also lift up Caroline and Stephanie and Angela and just the whole family to you today, Father. And we just uh, ask for you to touch and be with them, Father, and just help them today, Father. And every single day, Father, we just let ask for you let us all know, Father, that you're with us, that you're with us, that you're guiding us, you're helping us. And we just pray, Father, for your will and your way. And we thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.